Good morning. It's a blessing to be here, an honor to introduce Maria Laura. She is my favorite, one and only, younger sister. I've had the honor to see her grow for the past two years while we've been living together here in Lubbock. She's a kind-hearted soul who deeply cares for others and has always taken the call to the gospel seriously. She was born in Roswell, New Mexico, and at the age of six years old, moved to Buenos Aires, Argentina, where her parents served for over 14 years. With herself serving as well, very active in the church. Marilara has an adventurous spirit. She's traveled to various countries and has a special heart for Japan. She's learned the language, Japanese, and lived there almost a year. All this being said, I'd like you to welcome my sister, who I love and appreciate and learn from constantly, Marilara Valdez. So welcome again, and thank you for joining us for our Ladies' Day into the Kingdom. Today, we have a very special treat prepared for you, but before we do that, I would like to have a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for another day of life and providing us with this space so that we can come together and praise you, praise your name and learn more about you. Please guide my words and our thoughts as we meditate on your amazing kingdom and the effect it has in our lives and the world today. May you be honored in all we do. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Now, when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, he said the words, Our Father in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forget, forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus was really good at taking concepts from the Hebrew world that already existed and putting them into kingdom values. And one of the kingdom values that shifted in this moment was the idea of kingdom. See, when an Israelite thought of kingdom and they were praying for the kingdom to come, they were thinking, oh, Lord, please restore our nation to what it was when we were in Israel, when we were in the land that you promised to our ancestors. But it sounds a little bit different from Jesus' prayer. The thought of a kingdom, we know that a kingdom has a ruler, we know that it has a people, we know it has a territory, and we know it has a law. But Jesus' kingdom is more than just those things. It's not a nation established here on earth. When Jesus was praying for God's kingdom to come and for things to be done in he like on earth as they are in heaven, he was actually calling on God's reign to come here to the earth. So again, it's not a physical nation, but God's reign. Our Lord Jesus is king of the territory. So if we go to the part where we transfer all of these concepts to God's kingdom, Christ is the ruler. He's our Lord. The people are the church. So they're the ones who have submitted their lives to God's reign. The territory is anywhere where God's will is done. And the law, in a nutshell, is love God first and then love others. Serve one another. Today I would like us to consider what it means to be God's people. What it means to be dwellers in his kingdom. So if Jesus is our Lord, what did he consider important? Because as our Lord, what he considers important is what we should consider important. What matters to him should matter to us. And his mission is stated, for example, just the first chapter in Mark. It says, Jesus proclaimed, the time promised by God is come at last. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Why is this good news? Because it was God offering salvation to humanity for their trespasses, for our trespasses. And he was establishing God's reign here on earth. So what was Jesus' mission? 
It was to establish the kingdom here among us. As God's people, we are invited to participate in that mission. How do we do it? Like we do everything else. We imitate the one who gives us the command. So fortunately for us, we had a solid teacher, and we have a tender and caring Lord, and he left us a very good example. In Matthew 6, he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else shall be added unto you. Now, seek first the kingdom tells me, oh, okay, it's got to be a priority in my life. Got it, check. But what is this righteousness that he's talking about? The righteousness that he wants us to seek is the right way of doing things according to God. He's our king, he's our Lord, and, by the way, he's the creator of the universe, so I think he knows how it works. So, of course, he's entitled to tell us what right living looks like. And this righteousness means that we can have a right relationship with him as we live. What does this lifestyle that please God look like? Well, scripture's pretty straightforward about it. I mean, think about it. Our teacher, Jesus, he's the prime example of this. When he was here with his disciples, what did he do? We saw a man who, even though he was God, he had this very close relationship with the Father. And he went to him often in prayer. He depended on his father in prayer. So, Jesus was a man of prayer. That's the example he was giving to his disciples. Another example says, even though he had the power to command nature, with a word he could calm a storm. When he was confronted by people, he was humble about it. He could have zapped them, but he didn't. (laughs) Because he was humble, and he was wanting to... um, He he had a bigger mission in mind. What's another thing that we see? We see that God went about, Jesus went about uh, among the people, and whenever he saw someone who was in need, he stopped, and he took care of them. Whenever he saw suffering, he felt their pain, and he wanted to lift them up. He had a heart for those on the fringe of society, for the outcasts. So what are all these things telling us? Okay, so... If Jesus was a man of prayer, if Jesus was a man of compassion, if Jesus was a man of humility, Jesus wants us to be those things too. But what was Jesus' main passion? His main passion was reconciling people to their creator. So lost souls that had strayed away, and he gives them the message of hope that they can actually be with their creator again. And he offers them forgiveness and a right relationship so that we can be in fellowship. That was probably Jesus' pride and, and, and passion. It's the thing that brought him most joy. The question is, can I live like this? Apparently, Jesus is telling us we are his followers, right? He's telling us, I think you can do it. The question is, how do I do that? How do I go about this? So, As a good ruler and a teacher, again, he gives us the tools that are necessary to be able to carry out this kind of life. So 2 Peter 1 reaffirms this notion. It says, God has given us everything we need for a godly life. But if I had to think of one passion, sorry, one scripture that um, really engulfs this concept of kingdom life, of Christian living, I would definitely say it's Colossians 3. It says, In verses 1 and 2, since you have been raised to a new life in Christ, set your sights on the reality of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. So right off the bat, I've got two things. Okay, so I've got the things of heaven right here, and I've got the things of earth. And he wants me to shift from this focus here and come over to this direction. What are these things of earth that he wants me to shy away from. Let's continue reading the passage. It says, So put to death sinful and earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshipping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. So let's stop here in verse 6. If you're a Christian, you know that sexual immorality is wrong. 
We know that evil is wrong. We know that lusting is wrong. But I want to call attention to that word, that little word right there that says idolatry. Idolatry is at the heart of every single sin because idolatry is when we give something that's not God the throne in our life. If we say that we are Christians, it's that we've given God the authority in our life. So we let him tell us what is right and what is wrong. We follow his will. But when we put something else on the throne, we start following after that. And guess what, guys? We know that God is a jealous God. We know that he doesn't stand for that kind of stuff. And that's the big thing that happened with Israel. That is the thing that broke the relationship. Constantly, time after time, they put other things on the thrones of their heart. And because of that, God's judgment came on them. So let's learn from them and not repeat the same thing in our life. The good thing is that this used to be us. It says, you used to do those things in verse 7 when your life was still part of this world. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you've stripped off your old nature and its wicked deeds. There are three phrasal verbs in that, in that passage, from 5 to 9. It says, put to death, get rid of, strip off. These are all things that require intentionality behind them. They're not things that just kind of happen on their own. We used to allow these things in our life because it was the norm, that we didn't know any better. But now that we are following Christ, we should keep an eye out for these things. And we should be conscious when they start to creep in. It requires our attention. So we can give those things up to God in prayer, or we can ask for help and accountability with them. Whatever it takes. So the next image might be a little bit impactful. So don't worry. I'll explain it. This is Jessie. You might have seen her in one of the viral videos from Animal Aid. Jessie is a puppy who happened to be living in a lot and someone carelessly threw away tar in, in one of the areas where the puppies lived. So the puppies, probably not knowing the difference, got close to the tar and maybe rolled around in it. Maybe they thought it was water. I don't know. But the, the tar stuck to them. And in a panic, to get this tar off, they started rolling around. Because that's what you do. You shake things off, right? But in the process of it, Jesse became encrusted with concrete, with gravel, and it, it was stuck on. If things had continued how they were, Jesse would have died. But it was through the animal aid, the compassion that they had for her, the, the amount of love that they poured into her, taking care of her, picking away at the, at the gravel little by little, pouring oils on her, shampooing her day after day, that she was able to get to the point of, instead of death, life again. Now, Jessie plays. She can eat on her own. She, she, she you know, runs around with her siblings and, and the mom. They even found the mom. And so she was able to reconnect with her family, the whole thing. But if those people hadn't taken care of her, she would have died. And that's kind of like our connection with Christ. We come as we are. We have all this stuff caked on us. And though in the moment that we decide to, yes, submit to God and make him the king of our life, well, it doesn't change things overnight. Yes, we're forgiven. Yes, we're saved. But it's a transformation process. I wish that I could say, yes, I was dunked in the water and I made Christ Lord, and then I was a perfect person. But it doesn't work that way. So if we take all this stuff off, all this idolatry and immorality, what are we to put on? Let's find out what Christ offers us instead to lead us to life. I absolutely love verse 10. It says, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. It's through the knowledge of knowing our creator that we become more like him. So the more time we spend with him, the more that we learn about him, the more he shapes us to be like him. 
11 says, in this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew, a Gentile, circumcised, uncircumcised, bar barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters. And he lives in all of us. Verse 12 says, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, NIV says God's people, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Those are the clothes that Christ allows for. Those are the, that's what Christ clothed himself with. And that's what he offers us in exchange for those old filthy rags that were going to lead us to death anyway. He offers us life, and that is what it looks like. Being merciful and kind, gentle, and patient. 13 says, make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must also forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in you, in your hearts, for as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. Always be thankful. He exchanges our clothes for better ones. But why does he do that? Why is it so important for us to shift the, what represents us in the world to what represents him in the kingdom? Let's go ahead and read the last two verses of this section. It says, let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with the wisdom he gives. What we teach, what we share, it's not ours. It comes from God. So of course we should be humble when we share it. Because all we're, do, all we're doing is sharing it. And sharing is caring. Then it says, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And 17, if you remember absolutely nothing else from Colossians 3, 1 through 17, remember this. Whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. That is the reason why we are given new clothes. That is the reason that our old nature is stripped off and we are given a new one. It's so that we can represent our Lord. It's not about us. It's always about God's reign. It's always about our Lord. Why would he care to clothe us in a way that we would be able to represent him? Because we're called to represent him well. This is another area where the Israelites completely failed. When they were given the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, it says lots of things, but among those it says, do not take the Lord, the name of the Lord your God in vain. And the first thing that we might think is, oh, okay, yeah, okay. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. It means uh, don't curse. But it's so much more than that because another word for take is bear. And the moment that I put do not bear the name of the Lord in vain. Then we have the same concept here as Colossians 3:17. When we bear someone's name, we are representing them. We are their ambassadors, just to use another, another illustration from the New Testament. When I bear someone's name, I have it here on my, on my chest. I carry it with me all the time, even if you can't see it. Whatever I do reflects back on the person that I'm representing. That's why... God takes care to clothe us in the right thing. Because what we do reflects on our Lord Jesus. Now, this is not the only thing that God does for us. And I want us to remember for a second what our point of this lesson is. We're trying to figure out what it means to be God's people. What it means to be dwellers in his kingdom. So up till now... We've seen Jesus showing us how to live. So he showed us with his life what he expects from us. God teaches us what kind of lifestyle pleases him. So the kind of clothing that we need to wear to represent him well. And the last part. These are the tools that he's given us to be able to fulfill this mission. Because remember, it's God's mission. But because he's our Lord, what matters to him matters to us. And we set out to fulfill this mission. So the first part, the first thing he gives us is faith and his word. So faith is trusting God. It's trusting 
in who he is, that he is good, that he knows best for us. It's trusting that no matter what happens, he's got it and he's in control. And that, I don't know about you, but that fills me with incredible peace. Even though I struggle sometimes to understand why certain things happen, I can be at peace because I know God is in control. And that's the faith that I have in him. He also gives us his word. That's where we learn about all these things, about what righteousness is, about what God's plan for our life is, about this joint mission that we have. He shows us what's good, what's bad, according to his standards. Because remember, (laughs) we try to discern things for ourselves, and that's when we make mistakes. But when we look at it through God's word, we can see, oh, I see that I might have been mistaken on this point. So it allows us a chance to rectify those kinds of thoughts. The second thing that I think is super important that he gives us as a tool is the Holy Spirit. And I say tool, but what I mean more is like he equips us to be able to do these tasks. Without the Holy Spirit, that would be impossible. Now, the Holy Spirit is the most precious gift that we receive at the moment that we submit to God. It's, I mean, when we give this step of faith, faith uh, it's the beginning of our kingdom life. Um, and the biggest thing is from that moment on, we become the temple of God. We become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he is the bringer of life. And he's also the bringer of transformation. So what we were talking about with with Jesse before, chipping away at those things, that comes because the Spirit is in us. So when we fellowship with the Spirit, those things start to become uh, softened and chipped away. He guides us as we carry out God's mission and in expanding his reign. Now, back in 2016, Nature Immunology did this really neat experiment. And what they were trying to find out is if the immune system of married people versus strangers differed. And what they found out was really interesting because the results showed that married couples, even though they're different genetically, the more time that they spend together, the more they change on a cellular level. So biologically, They are two different people, but the more time that they spend together, the more they start to look like each other. Why? Because their habits rub off on each other. So strangers, eh, very little comparison, but the people that you choose to spend your time with, oof, that changes everything. And so the same thing happens with God in our life. At first, it's not visible because those changes are happening on a spiritual plane, so beneath the surface. But eventually, they become visible changes. When we submit to God's reign in our life, we give him access to our hearts, our minds, our time, our resources. What is important to him, because we consider him, starts to become important to us. And we talk with him throughout the day, and we make him a priority in our life. And as time goes by, eventually, we find ourselves looking more and more like him. So it's through this connection with him. And that's why I want to take a minute in connection with this Holy Spirit uh, equipment of the importance of spiritual disciplines. So those are the times in our life that we set aside to connect with God, whether it be through meditation, through art, through prayer, through songs, whatever brings you closer to God, whatever you can do to meditate on his word, those are our spiritual disciplines. And those help us grow closer to him, and those eventually through our relationship and fellowship with him, are what brings changes in our life. Another amazing gift that we are given is fellowship. I cannot stress the importance of fellowship. Now, after COVID, we can appreciate it a little bit more, obviously, because it's hard to be apart from other people. It's hard to see someone and not be able to give them a hug or whatever else, not to be able to sing with one another. We have to see each other through screens. But now that we are past that, we can appreciate even like more deeply the importance of connecting with other people. Now, back in the Garden of Eden, God says it isn't good for man to be alone. And though our first assumption might be, well, yeah, I mean, if Adam's the only one, uh, it's going to be a little hard to populate the earth, right? But 
<laughs> there's an even greater part, a greater reason for him for, for it to be harmful for him to be alone. And it's because Genesis 1 tells us we are made in his image. And when, even, when Eve knew, excuse me, Adam knew this, but when Eve was created, he had someone to remind him of that fact. He had someone to remind him that his mission was to reflect the glory of God into the world. And when we fellowship with the church today, it's for a very similar reason, that he gives us the gift of community. We will have moments when we are distracted, that we become confused, that we become discouraged. But when we surround ourselves with people who are like-minded, who have the same mission as us, who serve the same Lord, then we are reminded of who we are truly in Christ and for Christ. Let us not fall into the snares of the devil and be distracted from our true purpose and mission. So, on this note of fellowship, I know that it sounds ideal. It sounds beautiful. A place where Normally, you know, you would see a quarrelsome uh, group of people, uh, selfishness and, and kind of disorder and, and destruction and tearing of each other down. But in the church, I hope that it becomes a place or people can see from the outside that it's different. Because it's in that difference of, oh, this is a place where unity reigns. This is a place where there's peace. This is a place of harmony. It's different from what I have everywhere else. And on that note, we actually had a girl one time come to our, our youth event, and it was beautiful, because that was the first time that I learned in person the testimony that community life can be. She said, wow, this is like a fairy tale. I don't get how you guys can be so different, and yet you, can, you get along. And then she asked, Directly, She's like, why do you guys have this kind of spirit? Why is this energy here? And, she's, and we, well, we answered, it's because Jesus. Jesus is the reason that we are all here together. I mean, if it wasn't for him, we would have no reason to be fellowshipping with one another, being with one another, spending time with one another. So another aspect of that is we knew what each other needed because we spent time with each other not just on Sunday mornings, but during the week. Not just in small group, but because we became friends. We were our family. We were our community. And obviously we have lots of responsibilities and things to deal with, lots to juggle. But make sure, especially if you're feeling isolated or lonely in church, make sure to plug into a community. There is no reason to be lonely in church. There's no reason to feel like you're not connected to others in church. Another equipment that we're given to be able to live this church life, this kingdom life, is forgiveness and reconciliation. Now, I can't stress enough what God has done for us. We know the story. Humanity messed up big time. Sent everything into a downward spiral, chaos everywhere, destructive patterns began to form, these cycles that would never, never end. But the worst part about it all is that our relationship with God was cut off. And so that leaves us in a state of hopelessness. But God loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to be able to repair that. He bridged the gap for us, not through just a word, but through actually giving his life. And that was the only way he could do it because my sin, the consequence of my sin, was my death. And so he took my place. And when I think about that, it helps me to remember when somebody offends me to put it into perspective. If God has forgiven me this much, if God has hmm, offered his own son, given his own life so that we could be in fellowship who am I to deny it to someone else? And even if I don't feel like forgiving someone else, then I need to make the effort because I know that that's what my Lord wants. 
Does that mean that it's not going to hurt? Of course it's going to hurt because that's what happens when we don't love each other. When we fail to love one another, we hurt each other. But that's why he's gifted us this. He's gifted us forgiveness. He's gifted us reconciliation because dealing with people is hard. We rub each other the wrong way sometimes. We say things that are really silly and offensive, but that's why he's gifted us that word, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for offending you. I'm sorry I said this. I'm sorry I did that. And that's what allows our kingdom life to be able to be maintained. That's how harmony is maintained. But we need to address these things, and we can't just let them go. Because reconciliation pleases our Lord. Last but not least, love. Love helps us to do all these previously mentioned things. Love coming full circle. When we love God, we make him a priority in our life. We love what God loves. We love one another. And love looks like different things sometimes. Love can look like picking up the phone at 3 in the morning and saying, what's up? And somebody telling you, I'm going through a really hard time right now. I need to see someone or I need prayers. And you say, tell me where. Let's meet up. It's going out of our way to do the things that Christ showed us, to show compassion, to show kindness to others. It's taking a risk with people. It's opening up. Love is being patient with one another. Love is forgiving one another. And we do these things again because it pleases our Lord. And those things help with our kingdom life. When we don't see those things, I want to encourage you today to be the agent of change. Because it's so easy to say, oh, this, 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 this is not being done, so I don't want to go to that church. Close the door, try and move on to the next one. But I, I've even thought of that before. Um, not closing the door, but just like, oh, I'm really not satisfied with this situation. But when I see something that needs change, I think I can either turn my back on this and give up on it, or I can pray that God can use me to make things a little bit more like his kingdom. Be the agent of change if you see something that needs it. What we need to do is keep our eyes on Jesus. Because what he showed us, that's what we should imitate. Again, what's important to him is important to us. And that's what we imitate. I hope that this encourages us as kingdom dwellers, to realize that we have everything that we need to thrive. That God has given us an example through Jesus. He's given us the tools that we need to be able to carry this out. And we have our mission in Christ, which is to expand his kingdom here on earth. Thank you for your attention.